Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today. We're going to continue in Luke's Gospel, looking at chapter 10, picking up in verse 38. And um, I just wanted to mention before, um, I'm going to leave you to take communion. Um, I may read the passage in 1 Corinthians 11 at the very end, but what I would encourage you to do is uh, just spend some time before the Lord and uh, take communion on your own. If you have uh, family or someone around you, it would be a real special time for you to do that. But I'm mentioning it now so you can grab your elements and, uh, and just get ready. So if you want to pause this now and do that and then come back, that'd be great. Um, one other thing, I, I'm, I'm looking into planning an Israel trip for January 2024. And um, I've got some feelers out with a couple different Israel tour companies. If that's something that you're interested in, uh, please let me know. Uh, at this point, I, I do have um, a number of people interested and uh, we're kind of excited. Obviously, more details will follow and uh, time frames and deadlines and all that kind of stuff will come. But um, keep it in prayer. And if the, like I said, if that's something you're interested in, let me know. And uh, then I can kind of keep you abreast as to how we're traveling with that. All right, Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Let's read this and then we'll jump into it. It says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Lord, thank you for your presence in our lives, and thank you, God, for being with us now. Speak to us through your word, minister to us by your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we all know that life is busy and full of daily interruptions. We experience it day after day. There's an unexpected email or a difficult phone call. Perhaps it's a, a provocative social media post that grabs our attention and causes us to engage. Then there's unsettled kids and there's pressing deadlines, there's traffic delays, there's unannounced visitors and, 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 and so much more. But our days rarely turn out how, they plan, how we plan them without some kind of interruption. But in the midst of it all, there is to be one constant, one thing that we never forget nor neglect. And that is devotion to and fellowship with Christ. This is to be a constant. That's what we realize from this passage. Now Luke concludes his picture of what a follower of Christ looks like here in chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, the passage we just read. Earlier, though, you recall, he recorded Jesus as saying in chapter 9, verse 23, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would identify with me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And then from there, he showed the importance of putting Jesus first before every other relationship in verses 57 to 62. He looked at three different scenarios, three types of people, that would put other people or other things in front of the Lord. And Jesus said, that's not what a follower of Christ does. Essentially, that's what he's saying. Now in chapter 10, Luke pieced together three more stories to illustrate further what a follower of Christ is. And we've been looking at that over the past few weeks. We saw that we are ambassadors for Christ. A follower of Jesus is an ambassador for Christ, verses 1 to 24. Last time we looked at the fact that followers of Christ are good neighbors to all, verses 25 to 37. And now we'll see that followers of Christ are continual worshipers of God. Now from there, as Luke continues in his gospel, he jots down the story of the time Jesus' disciples asked him how to pray. And that's what we see in chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. And he does this to help us dive deeper into intimacy with Christ, that we might remain true worshipers of God. See, worshiping God is the most important part of what it means to follow Christ. And because of that, Luke records 
Jesus' practical instructions on prayer to help us do that, to help us to continually worship him, to really elaborate further on what that looks like and what it entails. Now, we're going to look at that next time. We won't get into that today. But for now, I want to set the setting and I want to go back and look at verses 38 and 39 just to kind of prepare us for the scene of what's taking place here. It says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Now Jesus is getting closer to Jerusalem. And though this village isn't mentioned here, or it's not named, we learn from chapter 11 of John's gospel in verse 1 that it's Bethany. That's where they lived and that's where they're at. It's about four kilometers from Jerusalem. And this is likely one of the villages that one of the teams of the 70 that were set out previously to prepare the way for Jesus. They probably came here and they may well have stayed in Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. But this is probably the time when Jesus actually met them. Now, as I mentioned Lazarus, that's their brother, and he's not named here. He's not mentioned. But nevertheless, it says Martha welcomed Jesus into her house, and she would have welcomed also whoever was a part of Jesus' party. So additional disciples, and there could have been quite a group of people that they were welcoming in. Because it was customary to welcome in guests, and especially guests of honor, along with their party, to feed them, to offer them hospitality, even though this was likely an unexpected visit. Now, the team who came here earlier may have said, you know, Jesus is coming, he'll be here soon, and, you know, just get ready. And so they may have had in the back of my mind, back of their mind, that he's going to show up one day, but they wouldn't have known that it was this day, most likely. At any rate, it seems that Martha here was in her element. As we read more of Martha and we see other stories with her involved, it seems that she was in her element. In another place in John chapter 12, where it says six days before the Passover, six days before the crucifixion, she was serving dinner to Jesus and his disciples there. But there again, we see her hosting and serving and preparing and doing all the things. She loved to serve, and that's what we learned from Martha. And for her, this was no doubt an act of worship, an expression of her love for God. She loved doing it, and it would seem that she was good at it. Now, Mary, her sister, the three times we read of her in the Gospels, on each occasion we find her in the same place, and I think this is fascinating. We find her at Jesus' feet every time. Here in verse 39, she's sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to his teaching. When her brother Lazarus died, and you know the story, Jesus would raise him from the dead. But when he died, it says that she fell at Jesus' feet and cried out to him in despair in John eleven thirty-two. 32. And then a week before the crucifixion, the passage I just mentioned a minute ago, we see her there anointing Jesus' feet with, with costly ointment and then wiping his feet with her hair. Now, what's also interesting about that is that in each setting, we, we notice that there would be a different aroma associated with each of these uh, times that she's at Jesus' feet. In the first setting, there would have been the smell of food as Martha and Mary would have been helping to prepare, at least in the beginning. But there would have been this aroma of, of food cooking in the kitchen and all that was taking place as Mary there is taking in the spiritual food of God's word. And so the smell of food uh, indicates this taking in the spiritual food of God. Next, it was the stench of death as Mary felt the pains of sin and loss when her brother died. Remember the story when Jesus said, open the, open the tomb and Martha blurted out, oh no, by now it stinks, don't do that. There was the stench of death as Mary there felt the pains of sin and loss. Lastly, it was the fragrant oil that filled the room. As she prepared Jesus 
for his death, as well as for his victory over death that would follow. It was a smell that she also bore as she wiped the oil from his feet with her hair, identifying with him, smelling as Jesus smelled. But it would appear that Mary had greater insight into who the Lord was, his identity, than most of his disciples. Many of them followed him, but didn't actually believe he was the Messiah. Well, they thought they did, but then they weren't sure, and they doubted, and they were skeptical, not until the resurrection occurred that they believed. But at any rate, Mary, it seems, had this keen insight. She was tuned in to who the Lord was, and we see that as she worshiped him and adored him and blessed him. Now, Martha seems as well to be sort of a take charge kind of person. She was quite happy hosting guests and making other people comfortable. That requires organization, it requires some leadership, it requires you know taking charge and doing it. And we see when her, mother, when her brother died, she wasn't afraid to speak her mind and to call it the way she saw it. I mean, she was very blunt and she was very forward with the Lord. Mary, on the other hand, was seems to be more contemplative, perhaps the more artistic, emotional type. One was fast-paced and a go-getter. Maybe she was the oldest sibling. She was motivated. The other was laid back and easygoing, just kind of cruisy. But they were different, as siblings always are. And Jesus felt an immediate connection with them. He loved them deeply, it says in John eleven five. That's why he visited them on numerous occasions. He loved them deeply. So he's in this house, he's teaching. People are seated and they're listening. And Martha is overwhelmed by all that needs to happen, all that needs to be done. While Mary, on the other hand, at least from Martha's perspective, is being lazy and inconsiderate. Look at her there, she's just sitting. She's not helping me or anyone. Now at that time, sitting at the feet of a rabbi and listening to him teach, that was reserved for male disciples, not for women. It was actually unacceptable for women to do this, and so it really wasn't allowed. So Mary taking a seat and listening was very countercultural in that day. Some people may have felt that a little uncomfortable with her sitting there. Oh my goodness, that's not what we do. Look at her. Oh. But since Jesus the rabbi didn't rebuke her. Well, they accepted her. They didn't say anything, they let it go. And perhaps people didn't mind it at all because it may have happened before. But this may have fueled Martha's frustration a little bit more. It may have added to her angst a little more. Mary, it's not our place to sit and listen. We know that, it's not what we're supposed to do. Plus, we're the hosts, Mary. It's our duty to feed these people and to look after them. Why aren't you helping me? Notice now Martha's complaint in verse 40. It says, Martha was distracted with much serving and she went up to Jesus and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Tell her to help me. She's not helping. Now, Martha may have rebuked her sister, you know, with that look. I mean, imagine a room filled with people. Mary's sitting there. Martha probably is somewhere, you know, in the background, but she's gotten within eyesight of her sister and she did that look. Hey, come on, help me. Come on. Maybe she made those noises. Hey, psst, come here. You know, we don't know. She probably tried to get her attention. She may have wanted Mary to help. She gave her that look, I'm sure of it, but it wasn't working. And so she thought to get Jesus on her side. Lord, don't you care that I'm having to do this all by myself? Can't you see my sister just sitting there, not helping me? No one cares that I'm having to work alone. No one cares about what I'm doing and the needs I have. No one cares. Lord, don't you care? That was a pretty harsh accusation. Lord, you don't care. That's what she's saying. 
Lord, you don't care that I'm having to do this all by myself, and actually I'm doing it for you, and you don't even care. She's accusing the Lord of being unconcerned and uncaring. Pretty harsh. Now Luke takes us behind the scene of her heart, and he shows us the core of the issue, doesn't he? He says, Martha was distracted with much serving. She was distracted with much serving. Her serving and showing hospitality wasn't the problem, but it was the over-the-top nature of what she was doing. It was too much. It wasn't necessary. It wasn't required. She could have served some bread and olive oil, some, some little hors d'oeuvres, but she went all out with a roast and vegetables and side dishes and desserts and everything. She could have used ordinary cutlery, maybe paper plates, but instead she used the fine china, everything that was elaborate. See, it wasn't necessary to do all that she was doing because she wanted everything to be extravagant and perfect. And because of that, she was distracted from what really mattered. And what really mattered was fellowship with Jesus. Now, we can't fault Martha for what she wanted to do. She's worshiping Jesus the way she knows how. She's trying to be a blessing. But there comes a time when service must be put aside for sitting and listening. And that time had come. Mary knew it. That's why she put away her apron and sat down. But Martha saw more work to be done, which distracted her from Jesus. See, what we do with Christ is more important than what we do for Christ. She was still working for Christ, but Jesus wanted her to sit down with him. We can actually get distracted from seeing Jesus by all the things we're doing for Jesus. Our service can become a distraction. And it's crazy because we're doing these things for the Lord to bless him. But we can do so much, so much unnecessarily, that we actually forget to actually pause and sit with him. We can become distracted from Jesus even while doing things for Jesus. So busy we don't have time to pause, to sit, and to listen. Now, Martha was hoping that Jesus would tell her sister to get up and help. She's wanting him to justify her. But instead, Jesus had a word for Martha. Notice verse 41, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you were anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Martha was anxious and troubled about many things. The word anxious speaks of being divided because you're worried about something that's holding your attention and preventing you from other things. Something is gripping your heart and preventing you from seeing anything else. And there were many things that were causing this anxiety for Martha, which caused her to be troubled. Her inward anxiety led to outward agitation and confusion. That's what this word means. The inward turmoil. Doesn't anyone care? Why do I have to do this? Why isn't anyone else doing it? Why am I doing it all by myself? What's wrong with them? They're not helping me. That leads to agitation, frustration, resentment, anger. Now, even though her heart was divided and she was distracted from hearing Jesus, Notice his compassion. Martha, Martha, he said. Now we read that and we just think, well, he had to say it twice because she didn't hear the first time. So he needed to repeat himself. But that's, that's not actually what's happening here. This is actually very endearing. He wasn't disappointed with Martha. He understood her and he appreciated her sincere desire to bless him and everyone in his party and all who were in the house. 
and he was acknowledging her efforts even. Repeating her name said in effect, I see what you've done and I can tell how much you care, but you've allowed your cares and your concerns to go too far. You've done enough. You've done enough. Why don't you now sit down with me? Why don't you hang up your apron, put down the dish towel, set down the dishes, and just sit with me? That's what was needed at this time. Mary has chosen to do that. And I'm. it won't be taken away from her. I won't be telling her not to do it. I'm not going to say, get up, Mary, and help your sister out. Because right now, I'd actually like both of you to be sitting down with me. Such is the heart of our Savior. The one who says, I appreciate all you're doing. But can you slow down and pause? I'd love to sit with you a while. It's important for us to do that. That's why it's necessary. If we don't take time to sit with Jesus then the things we do for Jesus will stem from duty and not devotion, leading us to look at others who aren't doing what we think they should be doing with criticism. Why aren't they helping? Why aren't they doing anything? Why aren't they? Martha was frustrated with her sister, perhaps angry and resentful. Look at her relaxing doing what she shouldn't be doing while I'm laboring and working to bless all these people. She needs to be here helping me. But Jesus made it clear. She didn't need to be doing all the things that she was doing. She had done enough. She was over the top. In fact, she should have actually taken advantage of the opportunity to sit at Jesus' feet, not sweep around his feet. See, God loves when we serve him. Hebrews 11 or rather Hebrews 6 uh, verse 10, tells us that God is not unjust to forget our work and labor of love that we've shown towards his namesake. He takes notice of all we do for him, but he loves it even more when we pause and sit with him. Remember what he told Judas who complained about Mary's extravagant worship? This is in John chapter 12. Mary, the sister here, she took her costly ointment, an alabaster jar. It was sealed shut. She was saving it. It's worth almost an annual wage for a laborer. And she broke the bottle and she poured it on Jesus' feet. And then she wiped his feet with her hair. She did that and Judas stood up in protest and he said, that oil could have been sold and given to the poor. We could have done so much with that oil. And it says, John gives some commentary. He said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he was dipping into the money bag. But when he said that, Jesus replied, the poor you have with you always, but me, you won't always have. I'm not going to be here forever. Now we have the blessing of, of Jesus' promise when he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And lo, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. We have that blessed assurance. But the point he was making there and how it relates to us is there will always be things to do. There will always be people to help and ways to serve. The desk will never be cleared. There's always a pile of work to do, but we have to make time to meet with Jesus. And we have to make that a priority. See, while serving God is an act of worship, sitting with God is a posture of devotion that inspires worship. Sitting with God then is where true worship comes from. It's where true worship comes from. When was the last time you paused to sit with God? When you sat down, opened your Bible, poured out your heart in surrender and asked God to speak to you. And then you read. And there 
words of God leapt off the page and spoke to your heart, and then you asked God to help you apply that to your life. And there was that exchange, that beautiful communion, where you spoke to God in prayer and he spoke to you as you read. When was the last time you paused to sit with Jesus? Listen again to Jesus, Martha, Martha. Insert your name there, Brad, Brad. Insert your name there and listen to the voice of Jesus. You are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. There's much discussion about the meaning of that word necessary, but Bible scholar Robertson, he suggests that there's a word play here, and I agree with him. He says, one thing is necessary among the many things. That's really the meaning of this. One thing is necessary among the many things, but here's the play. Among the many dishes of food that you're anxious about, the dips and the sides and the mains, the desserts, among all these dishes of food, Mary has chosen the one dish that's necessary for the meal. You notice again, it says that she has chosen that good portion. She's chosen the one dish that's necessary for the meal. And I'm not gonna take away her soul food. I'm not gonna take that dish away from her. She's eating, she's feasting, she's taking it in. Remember when Jesus remained by Jacob's well to talk to the Samaritan woman as his disciples went into town to buy food? And they came back, and when they returned, they encouraged him to eat. And he said to them in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. In other words, it's always more important to do the will of God. Now that carries the idea of service, but so does it carry the idea of worship and intimacy and devotion. It says in 1 Thessalonians, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now the context goes on to talk about sexual purity and remaining pure in a, in a lustful, adulterous uh, world that we live in. Nevertheless, the principle, it is the will of God, our sanctification, to be set apart from the world, washed, cleansed, made holy, and useful in the hands of God. But where does that start? It starts with devotion. It starts with that, that place of sitting and meeting with him and listening. See, that was Mary. She was feasting at the Lord's table as she sat down and listened to his word. And Jesus wasn't going to take away from her the best dish of the meal. She has chosen that good portion, Martha. I'm not gonna take it away from her. I'm gonna let her keep eating. Martha, Martha, why don't you join us? Come and sit with us, hang it up, and rest a while and enjoy the food that Mary's enjoying. At this point, I would encourage you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and look at the passage as it relates to communion. Paul talks about communion there, the bread and the cup and the implications of what they both mean. Just pause there. Read that, pray, take it in. Sit and meet with the Lord. Let him minister to you. Let him meet you where you're at. Pour your heart out to him and let him speak to you from his word. Father God, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you, Jesus, for creating a way for us to enter your presence, to sit with you, to rejoice with you. I pray that we would pause and do that. Not just now, not just today, but every day. God, help us 
to arrange our schedules in such a way that we make time to meet with you. And I realize we all go through different seasons of life and sometimes seasons are rushed. Sometimes it's difficult. But God, just help us to find that time and to make that a priority. That we might truly, truly meet with you, hear from you, receive from you, and go out in your strength and power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I pray you have a blessed day today. We'll see you next time. God bless.